Hello there, geeks. I've got an early access announcement for you. It's a new game getting some big hype and it's steeped in some real hot tea. Back in October, the folks at Donkey Crew announced that their new open world medieval RPG, Bellright, would be coming to Steam Early Access this December. Well, while I was editing this, the calendar rolled over into December and Donkey Crew released a new trailer that stated launch would actually be in Q1 of 2024. Now, if you missed my next test video, the Bellright demo from June featured the first zone in what's looking to be an expansive campaign map and basically let us have unlimited playtime to check out the quests, building mechanics, recruitment, and combat as it existed then. Donkey Crew has not been hyper-focused on promoting Bellright so far. We only just got to see our first couple developer blogs about what to expect from it. But when the game goes public, we're going to get to see what the last few months of development has brought us. The demo was great, I'm excited to see what that period of time has added, so I've gone digging through their media releases, FAQs, the dev discord, and near endless player speculation to get an idea of what we might see on launch, what we won't, and what that means for the upcoming early access campaign. So hear ye, hear ye fellow geeks, I'm the indie detective, indie gaming video contributor for thegeeklygrind.com, and welcome to our sneak peek into the upcoming launch of Bellright. Whether ye be noble or knave, the realm of medieval gaming depends on you sticking around to learn of yonder early access campaign. And if you're looking for more videos, articles, reviews, and sneak peeks in all things geek culture, whether that's gaming, anime, collectibles, tabletop, conventions, and more, check out thegeeklygrind.com, follow us on our media social, links in the description, and click those like and subscribe buttons to hearken to the newest indie gaming news and reviews. The medieval setting was what really hooked me into strategy and RPG games, with games like Knights and Merchants and Lords of the Realm 2 leading me to Stronghold, Banished, and now this golden age of Kingdom Come Deliverance and Manor Lords. And oh man, how could I forget a decade long wait for Banner Lord? But ever since the premature demise of my love-hate relationship with Life is Futile, I've been waiting for a really solid entry into the medieval genre that blends an RPG with combat and a a solid survival crafting mechanic to make a village simulate. Medieval Dynasty has been a really great balm in the meantime, but even with the great new additions that the Toplets folks have given it, with extra weapons and bandits to fight, that is solidly not a medieval combat game. Before I get into the new stuff in Bellright that's been confirmed or discussed since the demo came down at the end of the Summer Next Fest, let's recap what that demo showed us and what we know about Bellright as a whole. The setting as they described it is going to be the low middle ages, which we really see a lot of like low medieval building and you know, griminess. As far as gameplay, I'll quote directly from the developers, Bellright is an action RPG with directional combat and the ability to build a settlement, recruit workers, establish an army, and do narrative quests throughout the land. To break that down, it follows a traditional RPG framework with different ways to approach a storyline, and you can take different play styles supported by unlockable skills. Directional combat is probably best exemplified in the Mountain Blade series, although Kingdom Come and other games have tweaked and honed it. Depending on what direction you move your mouse or joystick, your character will swing or block accordingly, requiring you to anticipate or read your enemy's actions so that you can block, dodge, or strike at the right time. Building settlements, something we're probably mostly familiar with, and recruiting workers, that's something that we've done in Medieval Dynasty for, oh gosh, it's been a a couple years now? Is that how long it's been since that came out? In those kind of games, your relationships and reputation let you attract NPCs to your own personal village where they can collect resources, craft, build, and defend for you automatically. So long story short, Bellright aims to combine what's already well-tested elements of popular games, combat from Mountain Blade and the village building from Medieval Dynasty, and build a world around them. To me, that's a winning strategy because each of these preceding games lacks the elements that make the other games shine. Mountain Blade has no base building, outside of a series of great community mods, and Medieval Dynasty lacks action. Unless you fall off a rock that you're using to avoid the bears, then you'll get more action than you bargained for. Now the info that we're starting to get from the devs seems to suggest the amount of content that we're going to have at launch will be significantly different from what we had access to in the demo. Not that the demo was bad, it was polished enough to where if it were a $20 game from an indie studio, I would happily call that a complete product. Product. The demo version showed you right up front what to expect from Bellright. In the first 30 minutes of playing, you get to interact with villagers, get a little bit of a lore dump, and take progression quests. You know, that's the RPG side. 
Then you're prompted to build yourself a small camp and recruit a couple followers, and by straying anywhere off the main roads, you're gonna get your first taste of combat from the local ne'er-do-wells. And of course, you'll go through what is now the bog-standard survival crafting loop of gathering basic resources and making a starting toolkit, which, you know, can be kind of a grind. But by the two-hour mark, the game helps you learn how to assign villagers to gather and stockpile stuff using the ranked priority system ubiquitous in games like RimWorld or Space Haven. I was actually super impressed by how accessible the intro to the game is. Okay, so let's talk about the EA launch, the upcoming launch in Q1 of 2024. Uh, I don't think we've received an exact date at the time I'm writing this, but that could change as I'm uploading. I have no way of knowing. I do hope that when they narrow down the release window, they'll actually announce it on Steam or social media rather than offhandedly in an open Discord channel, but that's been kind of their MO so far, so if something new comes out, maybe I'll drop a video so that you'll have some kind of uh, inkling of when that's gonna be. Now, obviously, the demo was missing a lot of features slated for the early access launch. In fact, having talked to the Donkey Crew community manager, the whole idea of putting a demo build out was kind of a last second decision. Uh, it was a smart marketing move in my mind, but it was not something they had planned for. Kind of the first thing that you can expect is there'll be a lot more fleshed out on the narrative side. We kind of learned in the demo from the first set of NPCs that the starting Lowlands region is struggling because of a tyrant queen, and she's sending bandits or mercenaries, whatever the baddies are, she's the one sending them. We've also learned that in the Early Access launch there will be three competing factions. We don't really know how they'll be competing or if your rebel faction will be one of them, but they did use that number three competing factions with the Evil Queen presumably being a second. So the devs have outlined how the competition between the factions will unfold at least between you and the Queen. So you're gonna help liberate and defend villages from her rule, kind of in the vein of Far Cry, how you have to go out and defeat outposts and then unlock your way to the boss's stronghold. Most of that gameplay is going to take place in parts of the map that haven't been unlocked yet, so we don't really have a good idea of how that like capture and expansion mechanic is going to work yet. Uh, the demo also limited our build menu to just very early rudimentary village buildings, shacks and storage lean-tos with some basic craftable gear, so we're also going to get a, a lot more buildings and gear accessible right up front in the early access launch. One feature that was in the demo that I really look forward to seeing fleshed out in more detail is the step-by-step -step construction of each building, placing each structural element from the construction stockpile into the building rather than having two or three in-progress milestone models which is kind of the genre standard. It, this is a level of detail that I imagine takes a lot of modeling and programming hours to make work, but it really evokes a deeper feeling of progress and life to a tiny little hamlet that I think totally pays off, especially when you start getting your NPC villagers to automatically go about building their own homes. When you're doing this, you can see each beam, each branch, each pieces of shingling get added on to the construction blueprint. So there's really like hundreds, if maybe in later buildings, thousands of models that they've put together to make the building come to life from the ground up. The community manager and dev blogs have also shown off a bunch of new outfit and gear models, which the villagers will automatically equip based on their assigned jobs. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of those assets deployed onto the, into the game, and the second dev blog teased a variety of newer, higher tech buildings. Uh, I really look forward to ruining my GPU with a ton of gigantic buildings decked out with loads of militia guys. Uh, speaking of the militia and your larger army, I, I do think from where we were in the demo, there's probably a lot of work they still have to do on the combat on the combat AI and how to make that feel rewarding. The baddies feel markedly dumber than the AI in games like Bannerlord right now, with the only strategy that they have being really to bum rush you on their own individual initiative. That means you can kite them out individually sometimes and just pick them off one by one, even in camps with a dozen or so bad guys. Even when they're in large numbers, the melee fighters make no effort to organize, the archers only know how to stand out in the open and take hits, the bandits don't even seem to really react at all if a first arrow misses their head by a hair. But must be the wind. A really popular video by TKM Ferdinand where he gathers all of his villagers into a peasant mob shows how friendly NPC soldiers act while navigating through camps and mixed terrain. 
it's a mess. They bobble and bounce off each other and every piece of wall or building. This in particular is something I'll be looking forward to at launch to see if it's been worked on. <laughs> on the positive side though, the way that they're designing equipping, uh, equipping individual soldiers does sound really neat. Uh, with your village armory, you'll be able to fill it with a large variety of weapons and armor. And when you, when you conscript villagers into the militia or into the army, they'll automatically try to equip themselves with the loadout they're most skilled in whenever you call them up. It's, that's actually a really amazing sounding feature when you think about it. One that I can't immediately think of having been done before. It's gonna be so great for quality of life and having to avoid hours of micromanaging villagers gear. Now they did say that you can go in and give individual villagers specific pieces of equipment. You can manage their, their loadout individually, but thinking of not having to do that, just being able to throw 30 suits of armor and 30 swords into the, into the armory and just have them go grab that automatically, God, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, another thing the devs have mentioned regarding combat is that the balance of combat regarding the size of your army is something that's gonna need a lot of testing and iteration. So it's gonna change a lot during the early access campaign, but that's what EA campaigns are for, right? Letting players experience different designs and submit feedback so that the devs can hone in on a perfect balance between fun and stability. Probably the feature I'm most interested in checking out, and hopefully it'll be there on day one of the early access campaign, is the promised co-op multiplayer. Now this wasn't available in the demo, but they did say it should be available at launch, and there hasn't been a ton of clarity on the way this will work, but the devs have confirmed that the current plans are for people to be able to drop in and drop out of a host, a host player's game, with items being persistent to the host's world. Uh, in its current state, there is no way to create dedicated servers for multiple people to be able to join at will. So the way it's planned, probably the closest comparison is like State of Decay, uh, State of Decay 2 or Dark Souls 2, where one player's world hosts guest players, but those players have no permanent stake in the host's game. Uh, now, a community manager from Donkey Crew did say that a dedicated server option is highly requested, even internally, so it's not out of the question that it might become a thing in the future. In my opinion, adding dedicated servers is a very important thing to implement since any internet stability on the host side is going to lag or kick people, and having that happen even just a few times really kills an otherwise fun night of gaming with friends. On the topic of co-op, one thing from the developer Discord that piqued my interest is the idea that you can create completely separate specialized armies to be led by different co-op captains. So, for instance, if you want to create one group that's only archers, you can have one of your buddies join in to lead that group while you lead the melee fighters. It seems like that functionality is going to be limited to co-op at first, so you can't yourself control multiple groups of soldiers. Hopefully, eventually, there will be a way to order multiple army groups around without, you know, requiring friends to help. Not all of us have these friends. What I would like to see, for comparison, in one of the most recent updates to Bannerlord, they added some really great mechanics for ordering your units to attack specific enemy formations. I would love to see some kind of iteration on that in Bellright. Now, having gone through the FAQ to glean features that definitely will be added, there are a couple things that will definitely not be added at launch. Um, and some of them are things that you would actually pretty much expect. Probably by far the most prominent lacking feature at the early access launch is mounts. There will be no horses at first, but according to the mods, it's a feature highly requested within the team, as they put it, what's a game set in the medieval ages without horses? Medieval Dynasty went through a similar process where at first they only had basic farm livestock, but later they added mounts, uh, you know, in further content updates, and now it's actually a really great feature in that game. Bellright does feature a fast travel function that you have to unlock through kind of your early mission tree, which thank God they have it because otherwise travel would be a huge time sink on a large like open world map. Um, my dearly departed life is futile, similarly went through the longest ever development and deployment of horse-drawn carts, which for a game that requires you to move a large amount of resources from point A to point B was something players wanted forever, and it was one of the most indispensable parts of every, every clan's operation. Another thing which won't be in the game, which I will kind of miss, is not having a way to form family units. You know, as opposed to Medieval Dynasty, which is probably the most popular medieval village builder RPG right now, the focus on Bellright is action over prosperity. 
I personally really enjoy kicking back and making a cute pastoral hamlet rather than a brutally efficient war economy from time to time, but that's, you know, not the emphasis here. There are games that let you do that, and you can go play those games, but this is, you know, it's got a different focus. In that way, if they decide to add more peaceful modes to the game, that kind of speaks to me more like the Hearthfire DLC for Skyrim, which was about giving you a piece of land to turn into your own cozy little home. But that DLC, still to this day, is treated as kind of an afterthought by most of the Skyrim community. Um, and speaking of that, another feature which will not be available at launch is a creative or peaceful mode, which limits combat for people who just want to focus on village building. Although again, the devs say it's on the future features list, but it's not done yet. I did have some questions about stuff that they promised that I haven't gotten clear answers to. It's still kind of floating out there. I ask the devs every now and then, and one of them is related to village construction. Um, originally, they weren't clear on whether you were going to be able to create multiple villages across this very large open world map. Um, when you first start your game, you don't have any permanent residence. Right, you just, you're, you're told to build a shack so you can find a field, you set up your first camp and get a few followers to gather mushrooms and wood for you. Uh, and they don't tell you how to change locations, but it's pretty simple to just tear everything down and move to a new area. <laughs> that made me think if we weren't able to create multiple villages, multiple outposts, every time you wanna move in the mid to late game, you'd have to tear everything down and find a way to move thousands and thousands of resources, but I was able to get confirmation. You can build secondary villages, outposts all across the maps, and it sh they should function essentially as the same as your main village. Um, that way, you know, every time you find a place with a prettier view or more lucrative resources, you don't have to completely tear down and move things by hand. The last thing that I wanted to address before I wrap this up, because I know there's gonna be a lot of videos addressing this and making bold claims with dubious evidence, is Donkey Crew's history in game development. There are already a few videos out there that claim that everything Donkey Crew makes from this point on is just a rug pull, that they're going to launch something, take money, and then abandon the project. And I've got evidence that speaks to the contrary to that. You can find videos about Donkey Crew and Bell Wright just by searching them that have nothing but negative things to say. Let me let me defend Donkey Crew for a second. Bell Wright is coming off the tails of Last Oasis. Um, that game had a lot of hype before its launch in 2019, but since then it's alienated a lot of its fan base and turned them into vocal critics of Donkey Crew. Uh, when I covered Bell Wright in my Summer Nexus video, I touched on this a bit and referenced a YouTuber called Four Du Bois who went as far as to label Bell Wright a scam because of the way that Donkey Crew seemingly abandoned Last Oasis. Um, looks like they are coming out with this game called uh, Bell Wright is now their new their new thing. Hopefully, also, this stops people from buying Bell Wright because I cannot support a game with a developer that just completely abandons games. Before Last Oasis, Donkey Crew was involved in the development of a game called Of Kings and Men which first launched on Steam in August of 2016. That game was conceived as a successor to a popular Mountain Blade mod called CRPG. The early iteration of the Donkey Crew team raised 40,000 euro at the beginning of development in 2013 um, as kind of a private investment round, mostly just over message boards. Uh, but when they tried to launch a successive Kickstarter for the game a year later, it came in way short of their goal, like about a quarter of the amount of money raised. Uh, I can only speculate what happened after that, but it is educated speculation based on documentation. It took two years of development between the Kickstarter and when the game hit Steam. And from various press releases, it sounds like they sold off company equity in exchange for investment. Uh, Donkey Crew was developing Kings and Men under the moniker of Warlock Wireless, that's what they called their studio at the time. And in their UK stock disclosure for Warlock Wireless, you can see that practically all of the economic value of the company is owned by a mess of shell companies stemming from one called WCS Nominees. The investor stock was valued at £150,000, which more than covered the shortfall from the Kickstarter campaign, but they could have been given that equity in exchange for a lesser amount of actual cash investment. We'll never know how much they sold their studio equity for like in actual cash. All we know is that the investors demanded to have that valued at 150,000 euros, pounds, sorry. 
pounds. Of Kings and Men had a pretty good launch. It peaked at just over 1,500 concurrent players, but player activity tapered off really quickly. By the end of that year, they had sold around 115,000 copies, um, which is good, but activity, activity in the game was stagnant. When February of 2017 rolled around, a press release dropped from their investor group, Datalik, that said that a bunch of the Donkey Crew developers, including the CEO, Florian Hofreiter, would be leaving Warlock Wireless. Again, Warlock was the name that the Donkey Crew company was using to develop of Kings and Men under the investment company. By the end of that year, with control effectively removed from Donkey Crew's hands, the game was delisted from Steam completely. Uh, so this is one of the main points that a lot of Donkey Crew like criticism content revolves around, because it looks like the devs did a cash grab and then opened a new shop to start working on Last Oasis, but that doesn't line up with the actual dates and facts. It's pretty clear to me that they got squeezed out by their investors, and the only thing that the, the Donkey Crew developers could see to do was to get out from under the thumb of their investors by letting them try to run the investors try to run it and, and basically just buying themselves out. So personally, from where I'm standing, there's no real reason to call Donkey Crew a scam company or rug pullers, what have you. They do hard work. This is their newest project. We'll see if their promises come through during the early access campaign. I'm still going to buy into it. Now there is one major roadblock that keeps me from wholeheartedly hype training for Bellright. That's their publisher, Snail Games. I would need a whole hour, two, two, two hour long videos to discuss the crazy legacy Snail Games has made for itself in the gaming industry. Long story short, they have a history of releasing unpolished games and updates. Uh, they have a very problematic founder who at first used the company to give himself millions of dollars in low interest loans. Then he directed the develop the developers of Ark to give his personal clan crazy advantages on official servers. And then he tried to take the company public to get it some more cash liquidity and it immediately lost 60% of its stock value. Uh, if you want more information on Snail, look up videos by Kira TV, who does really great breakdowns of Snail Games' shenanigans. For the sake of fairness, I have reached out for Donkey Crew to get clarification and comment, and if any of the information I've given in this last section here is incomplete or incorrect, I will definitely plan on releasing a correction. Okay, so... I'm recording this like a couple months after I recorded my original version of the script because um, I got a chance to DM with a couple members of Donkey Crew uh, about both Bellright and Last Oasis. A and I got some answers I've been looking for. I didn't get much info about Of Kings and Men because uh, with only one exception, the people I talked to were newer hires. But one huge piece of information for the Last Oasis fans out there is that Donkey Crew actually has a team that is still actively working on content for it. Um, they have a mod development kit, which will allow the player base to make their own servers, ships, mechanics, whatever else they could want with access to all the game's mechanics. So, I mean, that's pretty huge. Mod kits like that are what led to some of my favorite game modes, like uh, like Britain Walda's Viking Conquest campaign for Mountain Blade Warband, uh, the Anti-Stasi campaigns for Arma 3, although, you know, admittedly Arma 3 was built to be modded. Um, or like the After the End Total Conversion campaign, which just hit the Crusader King Steam Workshop and I'm obsessed with. I mean, for Fox McCloud's sake, making a Mountain Blade Total Conversion is how Donkey Crew got started in the first place. So, you know, maybe in the future we'll see a group of, oh, sorry phone, we'll see a group of dedicated Last Oasis fans make their own version of Last Oasis and get it up on, on Steam for sale. So that could be cool. Um, so the one thing standing between the Last Oasis community and that bright new dawn is lawyers. The couple people I talked to at Donkey Crew said there were ongoing discussions between their legal team and the licensing people at Epic, who, if you didn't know already, now own the Unreal Engine, which Last Oasis was built on. Uh, but because my contacts aren't lawyers, they couldn't really tell me more. Well, as it so happens, I actually am a lawyer, so I went digging into the Unreal Developer's License Agreement, and Unreal is pretty clear that if you're distributing a mod kit which uses the Unreal Engine to run, and obviously that's what Donkey Crew's intention is here, there are restrictions on how and where you can distribute the kit. It should be pretty standard stuff as far as contract negotiations go, 
Uh, but if you want to find out more information about the SDK for Last Oasis, um, I would recommend jumping onto the Bellrite Discord and DM a member of staff there. For the most part, they are super helpful and very responsive, and they can get you to the right people to answer your questions. I will go back to the original video script now. Bye. If you guys in the audience have any information that I might have missed out on, or if you want to make argument or criticism of me, then please leave it in the comments. If I find any of it verifiable, I will add it to a, a correction video later. I will say that naming either the failure of, of Kings and Men or the fall off with Last Oasis as a scam to me is a gross mischaracterization. The investor's issue with the former is a matter of public record. You can look up the financial disclosure documents yourself. And the failure of Last Oasis, the latter game, is unfortunately the, face, the fate of most live service MMO titles. When they lose their popularity, they lose their ability to be marketed as recurring revenue for the company. And so there's no financial incentive for them to continue developing it. It's just the sad reality of live service games. So, in wrapping up, I wanted to give a big thanks to the community managers on the Bellrite Discord for keeping up with the rather large amount of questions I've asked them, to all the new subscribers who have come to the channel since my last video two months ago. I'm still working on meshing content creation with IRL obligations, so I really appreciate all of you, and I look forward to talking with you in the comments. Um, this is still a really small channel, so I do read all of them and reply to most of them. I always like to end with disclosures in the interest of journalistic transparency, so while the title card rolls, here we go! For this review, I have not received any consideration in the form of game codes, money, or otherwise from the developers, publisher, or any party with a financial interest in Bellright. This video is a work of commentary and criticism. All statements made are my own opinions and do not reflect those of the weekly grind. You can reuse any of my commentary under Creative Commons BYSA license. Just credit me and give others the same license to reuse your work. Stock footage and music is used under paid license from Storyblocks, with additional music from bensound.com used under Creative Commons license. These assets may not be reused without getting your own license in or permission. Thank you so much, geeks. I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Cheers, everybody.